You're, you're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We'll have more news this evening, but first, the latest genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 52 The Rescue of the Strangers. Welcome to Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Ashley Thomas. And I'm Earl Green. Each week on Genealogy, we dig through the Roddenberry archives, examining Gene Roddenberry's early scripts and the shows that resulted from them, looking for the socially conscious messages that were frequently found in Gene's most famous later work, Star Trek. This week, just when we thought we were done with Boots and Saddles, it turns out there's one more. One more boot or one more saddle? It's complicated. All right, then. Er, we'll be back with trivia in a moment, but first, here is how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also just the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on X and Facebook at Mission Log Pod. While you're at it, leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And please remember, your comments could be used on future installments of Genealogy. And now, this week's trivia. Earl, boot up your saddle, my friend. All right, thank you, Ashley. Now, I'm sure you and everyone listening to this remembers just a few weeks ago when we were saying, well, okay, I was saying it. We had covered all three of Gene's scripts for Boots and Saddles, well, guess what? It turns out a Gene Roddenberry trilogy is kind of like a Douglas Adams trilogy. Or as Captain Picard would say it, under duress, there are four episodes. So, it works a little something like this. When I originally created the spreadsheet that includes everything we have found in the archives, every script, every show, we did indeed have only three complete scripts from Boots and Saddles, the ones we've already covered. There was a detailed story treatment for a fourth episode called The Pushcart Brigade. But there's no episode of Boots and Saddles called The Pushcart Brigade. As much of the work was done compiling the spreadsheet was done in 2019, it drew on information I had at the time, and then I very hurriedly updated that spreadsheet in 2023 when we launched this show in the mission log feed during the strike. And this is where I straight up admit that in the appendix of Gene's authorized biography, Star Trek Creator, as well as on IMDb, Gene was always credited for a fourth aired episode of Boots and Saddles called The Rescue of the Strangers. And somehow I missed that when compiling the original spreadsheet. In any case, we did not have a script for The Rescue of the Strangers, so even if I had known about it, I might have misclassified that episode as completely lost media. But then there's this other thing I do between shows. You know how we ask folks to contact us with any information or leads on information? We're serious about that bit. And I do quite a bit of poking around myself, trying to establish contact with film and TV collectors who might have leads. I found one such collector who had, on their Etsy store of all places... Seven episodes of Boots and Saddles on DVDR. Not that they could tell me which ones, because guess what? The episode titles never appear on screen in this show. I rolled the dice on some slightly gray market DVDRs, and okay, two things. All of them credit the writers of the episodes at the end, so I just started jumping straight to the end credits. One of them credited the screenplay to a writer named John Champion. And here's the funny part, no relation. Even though it doesn't appear on his IMDb, this is most likely John C. Champion, a writer-producer who was fairly active during the years the Boots and Saddles aired. Got a good laugh out of that one. And by the way, John C. Champion, his biggest credit is co-writing the movie Zero Hour, which was quoted almost word for word in places by the movie Airplane. But that's not important right now. Then it turned out a quick survey of the other six episodes turned up one episode, sadly only one, written by Gene Roddenberry. 
So let's back that up and watch it from the beginning. And I very quickly realized this is not the Gatling gun. It's not the Prussian farmer. It's not even the Marquis of Donnybrook. A bit disappointing, but also kind of exciting because what the heck is this? That's when I started double-checking both print and online sources and found that, yes, Gene wrote a fourth episode, one that we did not have a script for. But the further I got into the show, the more I realized uh, this is the Pushcart Brigade. So the title was changed somewhere along the way, and what we have here is the story on paper in its earliest form and on video in its final form. I don't think that's happened since Norm and I covered that one episode of Harbor Command. I know that's a lot of info about how the genealogy sausage gets made, but suffice to say, we are serious when we ask for the information that we are missing from the archives. This episode is directed by Bernard L. Kowalski. Sometime back we talked about Robert Butler's status as guy you want to direct the pilot episode of your new show, Bernard Kowalski also fits into that same category. Among the series whose pilots he directed were The Guns of Will Sonnet, the original Mission Impossible, Beretta, and The Streets of San Francisco. He directed movies such as The Attack of the Giant Leeches, Krakatoa East of Java, and a great many made-for-TV movies, including The Long Hunt of April Savage, a 1960s TV movie which was written by Have Gun Will Travel co-creator Sam Rolfe, and produced by Sam's friend Gene Roddenberry. Bernard directed five episodes in total of Boots and Saddles, including two episodes which are surely polar opposites, Quiet Day at Fort Lowell and Terror at Fort Lowell. He was also the uncle of Brian Grazer, who would go on to be Ron Howard's producing partner at Imagine Pictures. Bernard Kowalski died in 2007. Robert Anderson guest stars as Corporal Ben Hall. Robert's acting career began in the post-war 40s, as far as IMDb is concerned, and at the time he shot this guest appearance on Boots and Saddles, he was also starring in another series called Court of Last Resort. He could also be seen putting in guest appearances on Have Gun, Will Travel, The Untouchables, Cheyenne, Wagon Train, Gunsmoke, and Death Valley Days. Robert and Gene will cross paths again when he guest stars in an episode of Two Faces West, where Gene wrote the teleplay. Faye Roop guest stars as Mr. Goodwin. Faye is another frequent flyer on the TV guest circuit, with appearances on Have Gun, Gunsmoke, The Rifleman, and The Twilight Zone. Faye was working very busily up until his death in 1961. Guest starring as Beth, we have Jane Nye. Jane was in the business longer than the men she co-starred with, and according to her IMDb trivia, she was discovered by a 20th Century Fox talent scout while she was working in a defense plant during World War II. She appeared in the newspaper ads for Hollywood Bread. Her TV and movie roles seemed to stop in the early 60s. We lost Jane in 1993. According to IMDb, this was the 24th episode of Boots and Saddles, aired on March 6th, 1958. To put that in the context of the other Gene scripts we've already discussed, that's a little over two months after Ella West premiered on Have Gun, Will Travel, and roughly three months before the Psychiatrist episode of Harbor Command. In between, Gene wrote some episodes of Jefferson Drum, a Western series about a newspaper reporter in the Old West, as opposed to a gunslinger, but sadly we have neither shows nor scripts in the archive for Jefferson Drum. Hopefully, something will turn up, and we can circle back to that show in the future. I met you just nine years ago. Have you forgotten? Ben Hall, the worst trooper I've ever seen. You want me to spell it out for you? Oh, I can remember. Can you? Can you remember your hand shaking so much you couldn't load a carbine? Can you remember you were a sneak, a liar, and a cheat? Can you remember your own bunkmates taking you out behind the stables? It made some sense into me. You ask me, can a man change? You made it. Every saddle sore, every ache and pain, it paid off for you. 
It takes the average trooper 10 years to make corporal. You did it at the end of your second enlistment. Why? Because the men respect you. Because I respect you. You want to go back? In the 1870s, Fort Lowell is a hot spot of activity on the western frontier. Boots and Saddles is the story of its commanding officer, Captain Shank Adams, and the men of the 5th Cavalry under his command. Act 1. Fort Lowell is playing host to some wayward travelers who were taken in after being attacked by Apaches. Tending to the fort's maps and surveying gear, Corporal Ben Hall pitches in some coins as some of his fellow cavalrymen take up a collection. Then it's mentioned to him that the struggling settlers are Mormons traveling through Arizona to reach Utah. That changes Ben's mood completely. In fact, he wants his donation back, and he chases away the two troopers taking those donations. Once they're away from Corporal Hall, Hatfield and Jesse are mystified by how angrily he responded. Obviously, there's some bad blood there, and there are plenty of rumors about what started it, but before the gossip can fly, they snap to a salute as Captain Adams walks past them en route to his office. There, Lieutenant Kelly is talking to Mr. Goodwin, the senior member of the rescued party of Mormons. Goodwin says there are still other survivors pinned down outside the fort, mostly women and children, assuming they're still alive. But Kelly and Adams are worried about reports that the Apaches may also have been carrying blasting powder stolen from a mining operation, which they could turn into a weapon against Fort Lowell. And there's another complication. Most of the men are off on a mission under Colonel Hay's command, leaving Captain Adams with a skeleton crew. At most, he can spare himself and maybe eight to ten other men to rescue the survivors and follow up on the blasting powder business. Two squads are readied for the rescue. In the barracks, Hatfield and Jesse are trading casual and not very complimentary quips about Fort Lowell's guests when Sergeant Bullock bursts in and tells them to pick up the pace. In Captain Adams' office, Corporal Ben Hall has been summoned to bring the captain the most up-to-date maps, and Mr. Goodwin is there as well, and he and Ben recognize each other on sight. It's not a happy reunion. In fact, Ben blurts out, Why didn't the Indians kill you too to Goodwin? And Adams tries to bring the proceedings to order. But Ben's not backing down. He tells Adams that Goodwin turned Ben's wife against him. Goodwin says that it was Ben who walked out, leaving her no option but to join the church. And Goodwin says Ben's ex-wife is among the party awaiting rescue. She and her current husband. Ben gets violent, and Adams gets between the two men. He tells Ben to wait outside for him. Before he goes to try to talk Ben down, he tells Goodwin to look over the map that was just brought in and try to pinpoint where the remaining Mormon settlers might be holed up. Outside his office, Adams says this behavior reminds him of Ben Hall when he first joined the cavalry, but not the man Ben has become after nine years of service. Adams says Ben Hall has changed for the better. Don't throw it all away now. But Ben won't walk back his prejudice against the Mormons, so Adams has to deliver an ultimatum. If that prejudice interferes with Ben discharging his assigned duties, there's a court-martial waiting for him. And right now, those duties include joining the rescue party. Adams will be watching closely. As the rescue party moves through mountainous territory, Adams has plenty to worry about. There's a choke point ahead that would make for an easy ambush. Mr. Goodwin is in no shape to be accompanying the party, and yet there he is. And then there's Corporal Ben Hall. Shots ring out from the hills above Adams and his troops. The Apaches have the high ground. At least one of the cavalrymen returns fire without authorization, but Adams orders a forward charge because getting out of the bottleneck is their only chance to survive. And they do survive, resting once they reach shelter, but Adams feels that could have gone better. As they rest, Jesse has a word with Ben Hall. Is his beef with the Mormons or with his own actions when he wasn't the man he is today. And if Hall's really mad at himself, shouldn't he put an end to all of the casual rumor-mongering among the men? No time for talk, though. Adams orders everyone to saddle back up to continue their mission. But it's not long before Adams and the entire rescue party walk right into a frontal attack by well-armed Apaches. Goodwin goes down quickly, and Corporal Hall breaks formation to get him back to shelter. 
when Apaches close in on the two of them, Hall mounts up and leads them away from Goodwin. Act Two The fight is over, and it was a bloody one. When Adam's men ran into the Apaches, they were ransacking an overturned wagon. Goodwin recognizes the bodies found inside and worries about Ben Hall. The men of the rescue party talk among themselves, and it turns out that Ben's prejudice about the Mormons has been infectious. Jesse tries to set the men straight. Folks is folks. Maybe the way they pray don't change that. Two scouts ride back and report to Adams. The hills are swarming with Apaches, and yet there are maybe still a dozen settlers still alive, possibly to bait the rescue party into hitting open ground. One of the scouts reckons it would be safest to cut losses and return to Fort Lowell, but Adams won't back down. He came ready for a fight, and he won't abandon the defenseless settlers to their fate. There's also the minor matter that one of his own men is still out there, alone. Ben Hall hides in the hills completely on his own, observing the Apache's movements. He hears movement nearby and picks up a rock to defend himself. Yes, it's come to that. Only to find not Apaches, but a couple of the Mormon survivors. And wouldn't you know it, it's Ben Hall's ex-wife, Beth, and Mr. McGill, a man from the Mormon party. Ben assumes this is Beth's new husband. Awkward. When McGill asks where the rest of the cavalry is and Ben has no answer, Beth supplies the answer herself. They're not coming, are they? Ben shakes his head. He doesn't know. That's when Beth accuses him of being a deserter. Ben assures her that he's changed a lot in the decades since they last saw each other, but she's not buying it. McGill has to remind her that the church teaches them forgiveness, but she's having a little bit of trouble with it. But help is on the way. The scouts lead Adams to a box canyon where the Apaches have the Mormon settlers pinned down. Goodwin is given the thankless task of being the bait to lure the Apaches out into the open, while Adams and his party take up attack positions. Up in the hills, Ben Hall has the god's eye view, and it's not pretty. It turns out that the Apaches do, in fact, have blasting powder, entire barrels of it, and they're setting a trap to cause an avalanche on top of the approaching cavalry. Even if he's unarmed, Ben has to find some way to stop that from happening. To his surprise, Beth urges Ben to be careful. He, in turn, urges her and McGill to stay out of sight as he starts his climb down into the canyon. Before the Apaches can light the blasting powder and put an end to the 5th Cavalry, Ben mounts his one-man offensive and takes a slug to the shoulder for his trouble. Despite that, he knocks out the two Apaches left behind to spring the trap, shouts a warning to Adams, and throws their explosive device into an open area where it blows up harmlessly. Back at Fort Lowell, the rescue party, and those they rescued, can rest a little easier. There's a knock at the door of the barracks. Mr. McGill and Beth are here to see Ben Hall. He's healing up nicely and addresses them respectfully as Mr. and Mrs. McGill, only to find out that they're not married. Beth's husband died when they were first attacked. Mr. McGill is his best friend. Uh, would you excuse me for a minute? With that, Ben runs off to see Captain Adams, who is bidding Mr. Goodwin farewell. And the captain has already anticipated what Ben Hall is going to ask for. Since Ben is injured, Captain Adams has already granted Ben a furlough for the rest of his enlistment. Ben tries to make nice with Goodwin, a man he earlier wanted to strangle, asking if he can travel and live among the Mormons, though he's making no promises about joining their church. But there's lost time to make up for with Beth, and maybe a chance to set things right. And Goodwin is more than happy to offer Ben Hall that chance. The End All right, Earl, I believe you successfully booted up your saddle on that recap, my friend. I, I feel like I just played a game of Oregon Trail or something again. <laughs> You know, something about the opening narration really struck me watching this episode. You actually getting to watch the episode, whole different experience. Right. Mm. The idea that a man didn't join up with the cavalry without a reason. Like, you know, and there's kind of an implied but unspoken because he is running from something else. Mm -hmm. I thought that was one of the deepest things Gene's been able to sneak into this show. Yeah, you know, I was curious if that was something they said over the opening of every episode versus just this episode. 
But when you think about it in the context of this script, I think it's more poignant that way. From what I have seen, it is not a standard opening narration for every episode. I, there is often an opening narration, but it's not always this narration. Mm, so this mm -hmm. one is specific to this story. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so I had to laugh out loud in the barracks scene. Sergeant Bullock bursts in and tells everyone, get a move on. Uh, he doesn't sound particularly Irish to me. He sure don't. He sure don't. That was the first thing I listened for. I was like, okay, which one of these is Bullock? I don't know. I, I'm i face blind, and none of these men are Irish, so I, can't, I guess we just don't know. I, I, you know, he doesn't look like he's been in a boxing ring lately either. Mm-mm, mm-mm. So I, I almost had a theory, which got trashed by the fact that The Marquis of Donnybrook was a much earlier episode. And this one is airing in March of 1958. It, before I ran across those dates, my theory was that the Marquis of Donnybrook was the St. Patrick's Day special. Oh, because get, there everyone's you go. Irish on St. Patrick's Day, especially if they have plunked down ten bucks for a "Kiss Me, I Am Irish" T-shirt. Oh yeah, yeah. I I definitely have one that says "I am 100% Irish" and then in very small print in parentheses "today." Today, oh. yes. Okay, when Goodwin was telling Ben that his ex-wife had joined the Church of Latter-day Saints and remarried, was Goodwin baiting him? Or did I don't or know. was that just Ben taking the news badly? Uh I I feel like it's it's him taking the news badly cuz you know, he Goodwin makes a point of saying she waited for you for 7 years. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like this dude, like, skedaddled. Yeah. Y yeah, you can yeah. get the impression by the end of the story. Everything that went wrong was on him. Yeah, yeah. It it's just that the yeah. delivery of that line by the actor playing Goodwin just seemed like, come on, come on, I'm trying to irritate you. But we may get into this more uh, vast differences between the story pitch and the finished show when we get into discussion some of it's fascinating some of it's just eyebrows to the ceiling yeah i do have to remind myself occasionally with genealogy that not everything has to lead to a zucker abrams zucker reference but when adams and ben are having their heart-to-heart -heart talk and adam says do you remember your bunk mates taking you out behind the stables and kind of the part that he doesn't says is they beat the crap out of you until you got your act straightened up. Right. He delivers that line so earnestly. All I can think of is Peter Graves saying, have you ever seen any movies about Turkish prisons? This one was really interesting. Circling back just a little bit, it's interesting that Ben says, oh, the Mormons talked my wife into divorcing me. It's like, if I am given of the understanding that Mormons don't really divorce, or it is... It It is not common, nor do they encourage it. I will simply say it's uncommon. Yeah. And there is a line later in the episode about forgiveness being a central tenet of that religion. That is true, by the mm -hmm. way. I have so many thoughts on this episode. <laughs> yeah. Trying to figure out the character of Ben Adams. So much stuff is put into his mouth to make the audience doubt that he will act honorably. I kind of wonder if maybe we went too far with that. Hmm. Maybe. But. Maybe. Wait until we discuss the story pitch, the version that did not get filmed, because there's a lot more of that in the pitch. And I'm kind of surprised. This show deployed... Native Americans, like Star Wars deployed sand people, they pop up out of nowhere and shoot at you. Okay, now that I have seen it on a screen instead of just seeing it on a page, this does not improve my opinion of boots and saddles one bit. Absolutely not. Same here. Also, uh, some of these uh, supposed Indians had some serious dad bod going on. So, I mean, there, <laughs> there's so many, so many levels of ick. Multiple levels of ick. If I say that one more time, it needs to be a t-shirt. 
multiple levels of ick is my new grunge band name. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Speaking of the music, I could only find a credit for a music supervisor named Ken Wilhoit on in the end credits. Mm. So maybe he was just a guy pulling bits and pieces from a production music library. I felt like the music was doing some serious heavy lifting here and creating the mood. Yeah. I hate to say it, but a lot of the acting was not setting the stage <laughs> as well as the music was. You know, we... we... We wondered, we speculated that we felt like Boots and Saddles was kind of a paint-by-the-numbers Western military-type show, and, well, the the acting is proving that to be accurate. <laughs> yeah, it's... And yeah. I realize the standard of acting was very different in the late 50s than it is now. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But even so, boy, this seems very rote. Like, mm. we are painting entirely within the lines and doing exactly the show you were expecting. It's interesting, the story treatment, the document we have, calls Fort Lowell Fort Hayes, when that name was inherited by the colonel in charge of Fort Lowell. So mm. I'm guessing this story treatment dates back before any of it started filming. But I have no way to tell because the document we have in the archives does not indicate the date it was written or submitted. So I am left to speculate there. Anyone looking for a solid through line to Star Trek? I will point you toward Ben Hall's two-fisted hammer blow to the back of the neck. Knocks out one of the Apaches. Obviously, this is proto-Kirk Fu in action. Because that is one of the captain's Fu. signature moves. I like the name Proto Kirk Fu. I think that's uh, I think that should be a band name too. Though I, I am not, I'm undecided on the genre. Uh, Kirk Fu is actually the name of a book oh. th that has been written on the uh, sometimes inadvisable fighting <laughs> hand to hand fighting style of one James T. Kirk. I did not know this existed. Gonna have to go look that up now. Yes. Thank you for that. So. I I have a bonus question that doesn't really fit into coverage of Act 1 or Act 2. This question is really kind of unique to the circumstances that led us to cover this episode. And I, I feel like we may have already tipped our hands a bit in our earlier observations. Was Boots and Saddles even remotely like how you envisioned it from having seen only scripts so far? Yeah, but I think it's because I grew up with my dad watching stuff like this all the time, like, in the background. So I feel like this kind of show, whether it was Boots and Saddles or not, was on almost all the time in my house growing up. So they all kind of blend together and look the same to me after a while. I can I can understand that. Mm -hmm. I... You know, I, I don't want to pan the show because, like I said, standards, the audience expectations, plus the production standards, were very different in the 50s. You know, we are talking about a show that is over 70 years old at this point. Right, right. On Mission Log, it's a very standard question, does it hold up? Has it stood the test of time? We don't ask that a whole lot on Genealogy because... Chances are the material is so old or unavailable hmm. that we can't really escape the filter of what our expectations of the show would be. Seeing the show for real, seeing it in action, seeing it as a moving picture, as the kids say, really made me appreciate Have Gun Will Travel all the more. Yeah. Because the shows like that and Gunsmoke that have some depth of character and some depth in the writing, there is a reason that some of these shows rose to the top and have stayed at the top as examples of the genre and examples of TV of that era pulled off very, very well. And there's reason that some of them have slid into such obscurity that you're basically doing a back alley deal for seven episodes on a DVD-R. Yeah. Well, 
Okay, Ashley, I don't want to take up this whole thing with shop talk and TV writing talk, but we have a rare opportunity to compare the initial story pitch to the final show here. <laughs> and while there is not a huge amount of difference, the differences that are there kind of gradually become more and more major. In the show as broadcast in the first meeting between Ben and Goodwin, Goodwin says Beth, Ben's ex-wife, is still out there with her husband. And then things get crazy. But let me read you the relevant part of Gene's original story treatment. And these are his own words here. Goodwin quietly intercedes on the corporal's behalf. He has sad news. Hall's ex-wife and her present husband are among the missing. Hall retorts that he hopes they're both dead. Then Hall suddenly has a frightening thought. What about my boy? Goodwin acknowledges that the boy was with them when they disappeared. Hall goes for the elderly Mormon's throat, Adams having to almost use force to stop Hall. Wow? Yeah. Jeez. So, uh, some key differences here. Somewhere between the pitch and the filming script, Ben's previous marriage produced a child. And then by the time the show hit the screen, it didn't produce one. But even more disturbing than that is the line about hoping his ex and her husband are dead. That's pretty horrible. Yeah, it, it, to be clear, that element is in Gene's original story pitch. It did not make it to the screen. If they left that in, that for me would instantly erase just about any goodwill I might have for Corporal Ben Hall. Yeah, I agree. Now, later in the script, there is an aside in parentheses, and again, I will just read what Gene wrote in this document. Note, anti-Mormon feelings here will be handled with historical accuracy and in good taste, consisting merely of suspicions created by the fact that they're different. We won't get into the bigamy discussion. By the close of the story, we'll have resolved the half-truths used, proving them false. So, my question. So, that was Gene's intention? Were these issues handled in good taste, and does the story resolve those prejudices? It's a good question. I am not Mormon myself. I know a few folks that are. And I would be curious if we have any folks listening that are of the Mormon persuasion. I would love to hear them weigh in. I rem what I remember learning in history class in school was that part of the reason Mormons migrated west towards Utah was because of discrimination. Yes. Um, so thus they made their way out west. Uh, to to uh, uh, avoid uh, religious persecution. Yeah, I so, believe that's fairly accurate. Uh, I can certainly understand, uh, you know, Ben's feelings aside about the circumstances with his wife, a lot of folks would have held certain suspicions about Mormon folks. Yeah, and I think... Ben's fellow cavalrymen uh, put that on display quite adequately. Right. So the prejudices here strike me as a little bit weird, but I guess they are the prejudices of the 1870s hmm. and not what one potentially runs into now. But that's just Act 1. Act 2 on paper diverges very much from what wound up on TV. In Gene's original story treatment, there is an entire omitted section where Jesse is gunned down by the Apaches, and since there is still fighting going on, Adams makes the call that they have to leave Jesse's body where it is. And this upsets Ben and has him openly questioning 
if all of this was worth it for the sake of these settlers with whom he has a difference of worldview, is the politest way to put it. Mm -hmm. And then later, when Ben gets separated from the rest of the rescue party, he finds Beth not with Mr. McGill, but with his son, Benny. Though Benny doesn't know that Hall is his dad. Apparently, they have never met. There's also a mention that back during their previous life in Illinois, part of what broke Ben and Beth up was that Ben fell in with a crowd whose anti-Mormon sentiment stirred them into violent actions like burning down the local Mormon settlement. That, to me, feels like Gene is not necessarily talking about Mormons in the 1870s, but more like he is drawing comparisons to the civil rights movement at the end of the 1950s. I think that's a fair assessment. Because this feels an awful lot like all of the times that we have discussed Native Americans in Have God Will Travel, or Charlie Red Dog, or Tiger, where mm. Paladin is interacting with people of different nationalities or ethnic origins and respecting them all the way through to the point that in Tiger, you know, he kicks the one guy with his spurs for disrespecting the gentleman from India. So this feels a lot like one of these things where Gene is using perhaps one excluded group to comment on another. And, you know, maybe just overall is saying, don't be a jerk to people, any people, no matter what they look like, no matter what they believe. There are some other differences in the story treatment. Uh, there's a scene where Beth and little Benny are attacked directly by Apaches, and Ben has to come to their rescue. The blasting powder is never mentioned in the treatment. The avalanche is going to be caused by a couple of guys pulling a rope. Yeah. But, hey, I get it. Explosions are cool. It's easier to show that on a screen, and, you know, people understand what it is. In the story treatment, Captain Adams grants Ben a two-week furlough, though he leaves things open-ended enough that Ben could potentially leave the cavalry with no consequences. Eh, kind of the same kind of different. I'm not sure which version of the story is better. It really surprised me to find that it's Gene's treatment, and not the finished show, that puts more you know, very vocal grievances with the Mormons in the mouth of the character of Ben Hall. And yet, if I were to wear the story editor hat, I'd have to say, how far do you have to take Ben Hall down that road if you're wanting to make the audience doubt his intentions? And then how far is too far? It, you know, and the fact that the line does not make it to the finished show, I think someone decided somewhere, okay, I wish they were both dead. That's too far. That's way too far. So, at what point does Ben become a really unlikable character in the story treatment who becomes impossible for his later actions to redeem? Yeah, I, that's, that's a good question. I mean, you've got him saying... I wish they were dead. That's one thing. But then, like, uh, she left him because he and was in with a group that burned down a settlement. I was like, the man is an arsonist, potentially a murderer. Yeah. At that point, I'm like, this guy's terrible. Why are we rooting for him? Like, I don't care what happens to this guy. I care about, you know, these people getting hurt. But this guy, like... I don't know that there is a lot that could have been done to redeem him in my eyes. Yeah, and I start to feel like maybe it, this is a case where if the decision was made by the story editors or the producers of the show, uh, they did Gene a favor here. Yeah. Because you would not be able to sympathize in any way with Ben Hall as a character if 
that stuff had been left in. And so it's it's a little bit of a shock to the system. I mean, we normally err on the side of if there is, you know, a good message about acceptance, not tolerance, but acceptance of everyone mm-hmm. and non-discrimination and not excluding people. We assume that's Gene doing that, but you have to keep in mind, this is back when he had just started with Have Gun, Will Travel. He's still learning the craft. And, and really, I mean, any good writer is going to be learning the craft the whole time they're writing. It seems here like the story editors definitely did Gene a solid by saying, uh, no, we don't want to include these details about Ben Hall. We don't want him to say that. Either because we can't say that in prime time mm. and get away with it, or it's too much and he becomes un... You cannot sympathize with him after that point, after these things have been revealed. Yeah. I think, yeah, the, the story editing, you know, did Gina solid on this one. I I think, though, I think your theory about Gene kind of mapping this as like kind of a metaphor for civil rights movement. I I think I see where he was going with that, but at the same time, it doesn't really make this story work. Yeah, but at the same time, if that is the intention, kind of look at the sneakiness and the subversiveness of it. Yeah, that's... When we get to Star too. Trek, Gene gets to talk about racism and exclusion by making the other people aliens that are not even from this planet. Mm. It could be that Gene is sneaking something under the door here about civil rights in a way that uses a bunch of white people. And so that's going to fly under most people's radar. Mm. But in any case, the, the thought about... Ben having participated in you know, the burning down of the settlement, without that line, it, it's a catch-22. Without that line, the metaphor to civil rights is pretty much effectively lost. Mm. With that line, we don't give a crap what happens to Corporal Ben Hall by the end of the story. Right. I think what I do like about this episode... You know, regardless of what what was in the Gene's original treatment versus what we ended up with on screen, is we do get a pretty decent story about, um, you know, you've got this one conflict of doing your duty regardless of what your personal beliefs are. That's I think that's interesting, uh, but also learning to work with people who are different from you. I I do think we get an interesting take on that, and I think that does work for the episode. Yeah, and I feel like even though the settings are very different in terms of both time and place, Gene may be transferring into this story some of his experience as a Los Angeles police officer. I think that's fair. And because, you know, again, something that we said much earlier in this podcast, back when we were covering shows like Mr. District Attorney or Highway Patrol is the police do not have the luxury of meeting people at their best. In fact, odds are pretty good you're going to meet them at the other end of the spectrum. You still have to serve that public. And so maybe that is where Gene is getting the things he puts into the mouth of Captain Adams here, saying that you need to get over yourself. I, you know, if you believe this, and believe it in your own times. Like, keep your bigotry in your quarters. Yeah, yeah. There's no room for bigotry on the bridge. Yeah. So, you know, there's a direct through line to Star Trek there. Mm. It's just some of the extremes of difference that we discovered between the story treatment and the show. Can you imagine what we would have thought if we'd had only the document to cover for this? Oh my gosh, we're like, get this, like, toss this guy out. Not a good dude. Yeah, and so now I wonder 
<laughs> now I wonder what the other three episodes of Boots and Saddles were like. You know, would we have thought any more highly of them? Of course, uh, you know, a script is a lot closer to being the finished product sure. than an early treatment like this. And, yeah. you know, fun fact, TV fans, a lot of the stories that you liked started out as treatments that needed a lot of work or outlines mm. that needed a lot of work, even from good writers. Ashley, I don't know if there's any more of a message here than to drop one's preconceptions and prejudices. In some ways, that part of it tracks very much like the kind of story you would expect Gene Roddenberry to tell. But this time we got to see the written treatment, you know, the embryonic version of the story, and that yeah. was a bit of a shock. Yeah. Uh, seeing how many more of Hall's preconceptions and prejudices he, he was going to be saying out loud. Yeah, uh, that uh, that was definitely a surprise. It's like, man, Gene, Gene wasn't painting this guy a pretty picture. Yeah, and I... Yeah, I hate to say it, whoever told him he needed to change the story was probably right. Sometimes it is startling how much a story changes from script to screen, or from story treatment to screen. The basic story outline of the Pushcart Brigade story treatment and the aired episode The Rescue of the Strangers are pretty similar, but boy, when there are differences, they are profound. What did you find here? About the same. About the same. You know, just this... And, and we see this later in in Star Trek, too. Like, working with folks who are... Learning to work with folks who are different from you. Whether you agree with them or not. But also this idea of performing your duty, regardless of what your personal feelings might be. I mean, that's that's a challenging thing sometimes. I feel like a lot of folks who served in the military may face this more often than others. Here, it's interesting. I personally feel like, for me, I don't feel like I would do well in a job that would require me at any point to act against my personal beliefs. And and, and even here, in this, Hall isn't being asked to necessarily act against his personal beliefs. Yeah, he cannot like the Mormons all he wants to. I suppose that's his prerogative. But that doesn't change the fact that these people need help. And, you know, if he if he doesn't yeah. act, they're going to die. So there's that. Yeah, what he's being asked to set aside is not his personal mm-hmm. worldview or belief system. It, he's being asked to compartmentalize mm-hmm. the bad blood of what's happened to him, which by the end of the story, we, we find out in either form, on paper or on TV, mm-hmm. what's largely his fault. It just seems like the the main difference between the two tellings of the same story is how unlikable Mm -hmm. were we going to make this guy? And at what point would that element of the story have crossed a bridge too far? So again, if there's a lesson to be learned here, uh, TV storytelling then or now, this is kind of how it works. You, You rough out the story in its most basic form and then with input from others you know seldom by yourself because he needs the feedback of yeah. the people making the show if nothing mm-hmm. else they've got to fit it into their budget but they may also have a vision for what their show is about that they are going to decide okay this stuff would be a violation of that or this stuff would be a violation of just basic good storytelling Let's please mm-hmm. leave this part out. Let's please not make this guy that we are trying to offer an honorable redemption to by the end of the story. Let's not make him a total monster because there's only so much yeah. that can be forgiven. Well, also, Earl, I think there's a little bit of a, maybe a moral meeting or message about personal responsibility and uh, Hall owning owning up to it. Because he's he's just mad. He's mad as hell. Like in these first opening scenes, where he finds like Mormons, rah, and gets all uh, you know as pearl clutchy as an angry white man can get. 
and he he's about to throw everybody out the room because you want me to help Mormons? Uh, so he's very upset about this idea and he's like, they broke up my marriage and blah, blah, blah. And is like, bro, do you even remember what you were like when you came here? You had to have some sense knocked into you. You know, this guy was clearly rough around the edges and he's, he's a different man now than he was when he started, but he needs to own up to his part of, of why his marriage broke up. I, I think by the end where you see him try to be respectful to who he thinks is Beth and, and, and her new husband, you know, like, Oh, I'm not her husband. There's been some growth there. And I think that that is good of owning your part of where things went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that's the version of the story that got told. Yeah, me too. Me too. Th- this, this one is what I kind of wish we had this kind of documentation for everything we cover. Yeah. But at the same time, this one was so eyebrow raising. It was just, what? Mm-hmm. So maybe it's better that, you know, like for a lot of have gun, we're just, we're just watching yeah. the show. Yeah. It, it's just a rule that everyone starts out somewhere. And, you know, we are, we say at the beginning of the show every week, we are covering Gene's early TV writing career. Hmm. So there's always more to learn about the craft, and we are still in the early days. Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Special thanks to the Roddenberry Repertory Players. Our cast this week featured Jeff Gaunt as Captain Shank Adams and Chris Thomas as Corporal Ben Hall. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log for early access to shows and the mission log discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry archive, drop us a line at mission log at roddenberry.com. Our website is mission log podcast.com. On the next genealogy beyond Atlas. Special thanks to consulting producers Matt Esposito, Homer Frizzell, Rand Hurl, Tom Kozak, Julie Miller, Mike Richards, Mike Shabel, Paul Shadwell, and David Takechi. We'll be back next week with more of your favorite program. This concludes our broadcast day. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.